Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, quite an honor, of course, to be the, the last speaker here. Really cool venue, really cool event. First time in Singapore, so yeah, very pleased uh, to do it. Um, this is not going to be a technical talk. Uh, I'm going to talk about my thought process around wh why should we do APIs uh, in my startup. Um, uh, especially, I suppose, like what is the differentiation in terms of uh, focusing on software as a service as opposed to APIs as it comes to scalability. Um, you know, those of you who are not in startups, you might wonder, you know, why, why does the word scalability always come up? Why are VCs always talking about it? Um, I guess in the absence of you know, uh, other metrics, uh, if you look at just startups side by side, sort of apples to apples, uh, scalability is just some high level proxy for their ability to grow uh, quickly. So the time scales could be different, but it's like, is there an opportunity for this company to be big? Um, so I'm gonna kind of use that as the lens to examine these, these uh, two models here. Um, so slight context, as mentioned, I have two companies here in Singapore. Um, I come from a tech background, so I'm a former developer, computer scientist. Um, yeah, in some ways, I, sometime, maybe five, six years ago, I lost my way, got into more business uh, management, uh, and eventually made my way to uh, startups. So I've got a um, health startup, which is a, basically a B2C company, and then I've got a B2B company, which is fintech. So this talk is more about um, fintech as it relates to you know, the B2B business model and how the software as a service and the uh, APIs kind of like manifest and, and what do we make of it. So really, um, if you think of software as a service, probably like most people think it was popularized by Salesforce. Um, you know, a long time ago, we're talking like 90s. Uh, so it was a pretty big thing. Then, you know, they had the whole logo of like no software, uh, et cetera. It was a kind of revolutionary um, thinking. And it's really been like, I suppose, from a startup point of view, like the, the golden standard uh, for a really long time. Like you sort of wanted a SaaS product. You know, it's like a, an acronym that gets thrown around. It's like almost the equivalent to scalability is if you just attach the sort of SaaS acronym, that means scalability, much in the way that you might say like machine learning equals innovation, right? It's like a proxy for that. So why wasn't software as a service? Why didn't it work every time for every company, right? That's, that's the question here. So I think um, when you think SaaS, there's a few sort of, um, uh, uh, let's say, aspects or assumptions that people make. One is like single code base. So this was one of the things that Salesforce did early on. Of course, if you think, you know, what was Salesforce version 1.0? It was pretty sad, to be honest, because yeah, it was single code base. Um, but it wasn't like Salesforce today, where it's like configurable, you have workflows, and you can create custom front ends. No, 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 no. It was basically just like one size uh, fits all. And that's what you got. Um, you think, you know, it's gonna be deployed instantly, uh, anybody who goes onto the site right away, they can have their own CRM or whatever tool you're doing. Therefore, the scalability is kind of like infinite. So you think, oh, we're, we're the sales force of something, right? So my company, Bamboo, we do online wealth management. So we might say, oh, like we're going to be the sales force of online wealth management. Okay, reality. Um, so th this applies... Um, to a lot of industries, uh, I, I would say especially regulated industries. So I'm in fintech, so financial services very closely regulated, um, which means that one size never fits all, right? So like from a regulatory point of view, uh, it's already a problem. If I set up a software as a service um, running out of, say, Singapore, then like what about Indonesia where you can't use cloud? So you're immediately sort of saying like to most of the market, uh, like no, you're just not going to be able to buy my product because of the way that it's set up. Um, then there's a, a, the obvious problem, uh, especially for a new technology, say like what we're working on, uh, it's pretty tough to decide like what is that one scope that everybody would use? It doesn't exist basically. Everybody wants something different, so if you build something that works for everybody, it doesn't work for anybody. So you have limited scale. So it's more like you sort of end up in an Oracle model where it's like, you know, uh, can still be big business, don't get me wrong, but it's not like it doesn't have the same cachet as like the Salesforce. Nobody pitches investors to say we're going to be the oracle of anything, sadly. Sorry, oracle. Um, so here's another thing. This is a bit fintech specific, but you've, you've seen this phrase, right? So I think um, it was probably Jamie Dimon or somebody who started this a couple of years ago, but I've heard this from like Asian banks. Everybody says this. Oh, like we're a technology company. So if your business model is to actually sell something to these banks, there's been a, a sort of a 
switch in attitude and philosophy. I think in practical level, um, uh, it's not really a reality, meaning like it, it doesn't mean that they're going to build everything in-house, but they're certainly building more in-house. They're certainly hiring more developers. Um, so as a technology provider, it's a bit of a pickle uh, in the sense that we're trying to sell technology to companies to say they're a technology company. We're saying we're the technology company, you're the financial services company, so there's a bit of a, a clash there. So yeah, that means we have a bit of a hangover situation that uh, we thought software as a service is like the dream uh, for any, especially B2B company. If you make it to SaaS, you're, you've, you know, you've made it. Um, so now the question is like, okay, are APIs then the new silver bullet? Uh, does it fix all of the issues that we had with software as a service? Uh, and are we now going to uh, all uh, become billionaires? So the question is like, okay, what, what's different about uh, um, APIs? Now, the obvious thing you would do when you think about, um, okay, let's do APIs. What you would do is you would take your existing SaaS product and then you would offer it as an API or a collection of APIs. So you're sort of taking the Happy Meal, which you were already selling, and then you're like, here's the new Happy Meal. Uh, do you want this instead? So sadly, what I found personally is that, you know, again, having an API library, i.e. a documentation of your backend, uh, is, doesn't mean you're actually uh, doing APIs per se. It's not really a business model quite yet. So I think this is, this is really what you want to do um, for a couple of reasons. So uh, you want to sell the menu rather than the, the meal per se. Um, so what does this imply? This means that actually from a platform, platform point of view, you need to be able to deliver anything off of the menu. And this is actually very hard. So, for the tech guys here, um, you know, most software, you would start with some sort of um, maybe monolith architecture, maybe some service-oriented architecture. This basically implies microservices. You need to be able to separate on a very minute detail uh, individual APIs that you can then actually uh, deploy and actually sell um, and co therefore commercialize uh, to clients. Now, the end result is sort of that, if I imagine from my company's point of view, um, and this, by the way, is the Samurai Burger. Uh, for those of you who travel to Singapore, don't try it. Um, the, the green stuff on the fries, I think, is seaweed. That I would recommend. It's pretty good. Um, so what you want to kind of do is localization. What does that mean? Um, so for certain APIs, whether it's payments, wealth management, whatever you're doing, you know, CRM, um, there might be certain ways in which you would want to serve, say, Vietnamese clients uh, different content. So th this is, in a way, uh, what you want. The other way to think about it is, um, you know, we're a wealth management API. So do we only want to do wealth management? Is that the only client base we want to serve? And I think if you sort of consider this menu approach, I would say probably not. Like, if there was uh, a dating service that wanted to use my personalization APIs, would I want to do that? Would I sell the API to them? And I would say, of course you do, right? So that is one of the opportunities of the API model and exposing the menu is sort of, there might be use cases which you haven't thought of, but developers uh, or, or you know, enterprise clients for that might find your API, discover it, and integrate it into their software. So really, this is actually the dream. Um, it's not to build a hamburger, it's not really to build, build even the menu. You wanna find uh, and develop the actual architecture um, so that you can deliver any meal, right? That's fundamentally what it's about. So whether it's somebody popping by for a quick milkshake or somebody bringing the whole family to buy you know, a full meal, you want to be able to serve those both uh, quickly and basically uh, then charge on volume. Okay, sorry, slight dig here at IBM. I know you guys are sponsoring. Um, traditionally, this is how enterprise software works. So I've, I've done enterprise software for what is it now? Uh, 20 years. Um, and when I started, it was all single platform. If you wanted to do CRM, you went with maybe Salesforce. If you wanted to do a website, you used like Adobe Experience Manager or something. So you had these like big enterprise platforms where everything came along with it. It was like fully integrated, it had analytics, you name it. Everything came in the package. And obviously it cost like a million dollars or $10 million or something like that. Something like that. So it was like a big, chunky enterprise deal, you know, five-year commitments, all that jazz. You had Accenture or somebody coming in to do the integration work, you know, massive, like, transformational projects. Um, if I think of, like, 
what does it look like now if you think of like, I don't know, something like a, a basic website or basic app? This is now the sort of new school uh, way of doing things, wh which means that if you're sort of, um, say, a services company and you're delivering enterprise software, it's no longer enough to just say, okay, we're experts in like Adobe Experience Manager. Uh, the new way of doing things is like you, you have to understand the whole ecosystem of APIs that you can plug in for different purposes. So these logos that I chose are actually all technologies that we use uh, as part of our uh, platform, right? So we are <laughs> selling APIs, but we're also consuming tons of APIs. So you know, if you're not familiar with these, they range from everything from um, machine learning to payments, analytics, uh, digital signatures, uh, basically chatbots, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, the, the full gamut. So this allows you to build almost like any software or any website, any app, um, and just focus on the functionality. And you get all of these sort of main infrastructure components right off the shelf. You can sign up instantly, and you only pay on volume. So you don't need to put up, say, a million dollars to get access to these. You don't put up anything, and you start using, and you charge as you go. OK. so. What is uh, the, the catch? There's uh, obviously always a catch. So this is the uh, Gartner hype cycle. Most of you would have seen this. Um, you know, it, it gets referenced whenever there's a new cool technology, say like machine learning, especially it's like, oh, it's overhyped. Now we're in the trough of disillusionment. You know, it's like, oh, we're in the AI winter or whatever. Um, and then it always passes through, and you know, then we get into the productive phase where things start uh, being commercialized fully, and there's a maturity in the technologies, there's some convergence of the, the players, et cetera, et cetera. So I've overlaid a few things in red, which I think sort of relate particularly to a B2B business model, which is that sort of expectations actually correspond quite uh, closely to demand. So like, uh, let's say, clients interested in your solution or this technology, literally like leads on your website, et cetera. So when we started doing online wealth management, also known as robo-advisory, uh, in 2016, there was like a, a huge peak in demand. We got lots of leads and you know, invitations to speak at conferences and all this good stuff. Um, but really, all clients wanted to do was pilots. They were like, oh, we don't know if this is really going to be a thing that we're going to do, and we don't want to commit, so can we just try something, you know, do a little uh, few months pilot, et cetera. So this is really the only thing you can sell at this point, uh, sadly. Then when you actually start having a platform together, um, you know, everything starts going downhill. Um, of course, you, know, you get fewer demand, but you actually start getting bigger deals. So people start committing. Um, you, know, you start getting like multi-year contracts or whatever. So you start building up the business. And then gradually, gradually, um, you can build up scale once the sort of maturity of the market uh, increases. Now, how does this relate to software as a service and APIs? So this, this is my experience. Um, in a bunch of different kind of products and, and services models uh, over the years. So you might have a different experience. You might go about it slightly differently. But initially, there's almost like no other option than custom software. Because again, if you started with, oh, everybody wants this thing. Uh, let's you know, build a software as a service platform. You're going to have that question of like, what is that feature set that everybody wants? There is no feature set that everybody wants. Everybody wants something different. So that, you're, you're going to struggle with that, in, in my experience. So most, most companies, they start fast. They hack something together, some custom software. Each client gets a little different version of the software. It's usually like a monolith architecture. You haven't really gone through the trouble of thinking of like, what are the right modules? How do we segregate different parts of the application? What are the parts of the application? So it becomes like a hodgepodge. You just keep adding to it. But I think this is actually a good thing, because if you sort of try to over-engineer and you try to like, plan too far in the future, you risk spending a lot more product development time, say six months to a year, working on something which, in the end, nobody will buy. So it's better to actually sort of do it quick, dirty, ugly, uh, suffer the consequences, and then get over this kind of um, peak of, of uh, the hype cycle. Now, then you can land a few clients in the early days, and that's really all you needed, right? Because it builds credibility into your business. And then when, when sort of the hype starts dying down, you've done a few pilots, maybe you see that, OK, we did you know, five, six, whatever pilots, um, that there's some commonality here. Uh, OK, that 
these clients who are like the, the biggest tier one clients, they seem to want this type of functionality. Okay, so this is clearly something we would probably want to do in the SaaS product. But you might also learn something like, oh, maybe the tier one clients are actually not the right fit for us because maybe there's nothing in common with the tier one clients. So you go one or two tiers down to maybe like more, if not SMEs, but at least like mid-sized companies, um, and you find, okay, there's a feature set here that we can sort of unify and offer as a single platform. So you start kind of going through that thought process. What that also does in terms of your software architecture, you start thinking about what are the right modules. Like, okay, we clearly need a customer module. We clearly need a, I don't know, analytics module. Uh, clearly there's a recommendation engine underneath here that we're gonna need, et cetera. So you start also compartmentalizing uh, the software. So really only then, I think, does it make sense to start thinking about the APIs because, again, from an architecture point of view, that implies microservices. So now you're chopping up those blocks of software into the sort of core components and trying to expose those as APIs. So it only makes sense to do that once you sort of know what is the broad feature set that people even want to uh, buy from you as the maturity increases. So really, this is like the... Um, end stage, this is the sort of you know, unicorn territory or whatever that you sort of dream about. Um, reference obviously to uh, Record Ralph or Ralph breaks the internet. Um, the goal is not necessarily to break the internet, but it's to be on the internet. And what I mean by that is, if you look at all the, the logos there, you see the WhatsApps and Instagrams, etc., is ultimately you would want your API to be embedded into high volume, large uh, uh, applications. Right? So rather than you sell to each client one by one, you would want to basically find some commodity or utility function to your APIs. So if you think again, like who's done this successfully? Stripe, which is probably, I don't know, probably every person on stage has referenced uh, Stripe at some point. That's, that's right now, that's like the sales force of APIs, I would say. They've, they've pretty much set the bar, um, I would say. So right, if you think of all these online platforms, um, Stripe is underneath a lot of them. Now, of course, you know, they're not necessarily everywhere in the world, so we just looked at the Chinese example. So again, in China, you have similar platforms um, that have that sort of utility level function. Now, can everybody do that? Can you do exactly what Stripe has done? Obviously not, obviously not. So we're not gonna go from you know, wealth management APIs to some sort of payment gateway aggregator. It's pretty unlikely. But you know, could we find some utility functions that each or most of the online wealth platforms or digital savings apps find some way to use some of our APIs. And again, it could be some niche thing, like maybe it's the personalization engine that is so great specifically for wealth management use cases. And that's the thing that then becomes the utility. So you know, if you think of PayPal, uh, it started from the vision of Elon Musk and X.com, which was supposed to be the first universal online virtual bank. But when they started building the platform, they got early success with so-called email payments. And it ended up, that's the only thing that they still do even after 20 years, right? So that's, I think, where you would want to get to is like you don't necessarily know the right answer, but if you put those tools out there, you might find uh, actually that the scalability comes from you know, the most surprising uh, parts of your application. Okay, that's, that's all I had. By the way, um, if you want to check out some of my other stuff, uh, you can go to my Medium site or then uh, just LinkedIn and follow me there. Thank you. Thank you, Aiki. Any questions? It's your last opportunity to ask a questions <laughs> in the API Day Singapore. Take it. Yes. Thanks, Aiki. So we've seen in the more traditional financial services space a lot of the incumbents opening up APIs which I guess is an opportunity for them, but also must present a risk, right? Because if they're opening up their APIs, it allows people to start connecting in and, and proving themselves to, to be better than what's on offer. So what's your kind of view on how the more established financial services community should approach that from, from a risk mitigation point of view, given that the industry is very much moving in, the, in that direction? Yeah, so I think there's probably actually a few uh, segments within that. Um, it's very interesting because in some ways I think it's quite different to what I'm talking about because I'm really thinking from the lens of the startup who's looking to collaborate with uh, the financial services company. 
So we're sort of like riding on the coattails of, of the big boys. Um, the big boys themselves, so if you start with banks, I would say um, for the banks, the, the writing is on the wall. It's not going to be a choice. Uh, it's going to be a regulatory um, mandate. So really open banking, PSD2 in Europe, that's already happened. So I think you know, the, the reason for doing that from a regulatory point of view is probably transparency and it really forces uh, banks to play fair on things like pricing and transparency. So as soon as if there, there's an issue with your bank, you have the ability to basically go online and in sort of, if not five minutes, then let's say 15 minutes, pretty much open a new account, move your money across, close the old account. Uh, which if you think of like the current state of play, say in Singapore, this would take you like two weeks, right? There's paperwork, you have to bring your passport, there's checks involved, signatures, uh, they've made it pretty difficult. So from a consumer protection point of view, that makes sense. But then if I think of all the other players um, in the ecosystem, uh, I think broadly speaking, um, you would have the sort of same objectives, I suppose, as, as the startup in the sense that um, if you've already got assets built, software, data, whatever it is, particularly data, um, that's valuable to somebody else. So really, from a sort of experimental business model, um, innovation point of view, I think opening up those APIs has almost no downsides, right? Because it, what you can learn from that is like, oh, um, we always thought that this data that we had from the past 20 years wasn't that valuable, but it turns out for this use case or this industry, it seems like there's a lot of developers looking into this type of data and asking us about it, so there might be something there. So it just like opens up um, your business to a lot of potential new opportunities uh, and ideas which you, you never had before. So I think it like, in some ways, it, it's not the same as open source, but it has some of the same benefits as open source, as in it opens you up to, to new opportunities. Thank you. Any other questions? Where's the networking? Where's the beer? These are important questions. That's what MIDI is here for, I guess. So we'll give uh, the mic to, uh, first of all, big round of applause for Ike. Thank you very much.